Welcome to the Lipedema podcast hosted by Shell and Tiana. Our aim is to make noise around lipedema and educate as many people as we can about this disease. Our guest list contains professionals who work in the field and women who live with lipedema. Thank you for joining us. Jen is an experienced professional with a strong background in human resources and the hospitality industry. She currently serves as the chair of Lipedema Australia, where she brings her wealth of professional experience to the role. Jen is highly regarded for her exceptional organisational skills and meticulous planning. Her love of spreadsheets is well known and has been demonstrated through her successful co-organisation of the 2022 Lipedema Australia National Conference. By bringing together a diverse range of speakers and exhibitors, Jen provided an important platform for attendees to learn about lipedema and connect with others in the community. This event played a significant role in raising awareness and offering support to those affected by lipedema. Beyond her professional endeavours, Jen is passionate about supporting individuals impacted by lipedema. She actively works towards increasing public awareness and providing assistance to those in need. As a new mother, she doesn't have much spare time between looking after her two young boys and her volunteer work with Lipedema Australia. However, she one day hopes to get back into her old hobbies of photography and travelling. All right, this is Shelley and Tiana and today we are talking to Jen. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Jen, can you tell us a little bit about you, please? Yeah, so um, my name's Jen. I am the mum of two little boys. One of them is four months and the other is two and a half. Um, and I am the chair of Lipedema Australia in my spare time. In that little bit of spare time that you have, you are doing an amazing job. But we'll get to that later. Um, yep. When did you first hear about lipedema? Do you have lipedema? Yes, so I have lipedema myself. Mm -hmm. I first heard about it, I had just turned 30. I was doctor Googling, trying to figure out why I had pain in my legs. Um, obviously stumbled across lipedema, went, holy, this is me. And, you know, sent it to my fiance at the time, my now husband, and I was like, I think this is me. Like, I think this is what I have. And uh, that's kind of how, how I got down this rabbit hole of lipedema. Wow. So it was the pain that started you. Like, yeah. did you notice anything else apart from that? No, that was it. So I had, I had pain in my legs and it wasn't as in I have pain on contact as well, but it was just this weird, it was this pain, you know, I'd have a sit stand desk at work and it was just while I was standing, to be honest, it would be this really weird pain in my legs and I, it didn't seem quite right. I'd, you know, I'd been a fairly active teenager. I've, experienced many injuries over time but it didn't kind of feel like any of those injuries I'd experienced before it was it was different than that that's weird hey because a lot of us um don't actually have pain it's all about that disproportion and those heavy legs but not the actual pain just like a contact pain so it just shows how individual this disease is yeah absolutely and it, it is interesting because it's something that for me has come and gone so it's not something I live with day in day out I know there are plenty of people that do live with constant pain I noticed uh, a couple of months after giving birth I had a little bit of pain again but it's kind of eased up um, and and I can't quite figure out what the pain is associated to it doesn't appear to be associated to um, you know to diet uh, it doesn't appear to be associated to hormones from what I can tell so yeah it's a really interesting one it is super interesting. Now, you wanted to focus on progression during pregnancy. Now, this is a big concern within our community, and I see it all the time being asked in the groups I'm, members, I'm a member of. Um, can you tell us if, you're, if there was progression during pregnancy for you? Yeah, so I think uh, that's one of the things that I – that's why I'm really happy to try and share my story with everyone. So I personally have not experienced progression. So I've now had two pregnancies, 
as I said, I'm four months postpartum from my second pregnancy. I remember when I was 10 weeks postpartum from my first and, you know, I had experienced no progression. I actually lost weight prior to delivering. I mean, after I delivered. Um, yeah. So within two weeks of delivering my first, I had lost 10 kilos um, more than what I was when I fell pregnant, which I was very surprised about. But I remember at 10 weeks postpartum, I put a post up in um, in the Lipedema Australia Facebook group saying, you know, this is my experience. I've had no progression so far, you know, like I'm really happy. And there were so many people that commented saying, oh, just you wait, it'll come for you. It's not, it's too early. You can't say at this point that you've had no progression. Tell us at 18 months postpartum that you haven't. And so actually 18 months down the track, I went and found my post and I went and commented on it saying, hey, for all of you that were following along originally, just letting you know, I'm now 18 months postpartum. I've had no progression. This is my experience. Um, and yeah, second time round, I'm lucky again. I haven't had that progression. Yeah, I didn't have any progression. Well, I didn't know about lipedema back then. But now that I've sort of done that timeline to see where everything happened, it wasn't during pregnancy. Like pregnancy yeah. wasn't a factor for me either. I had some hormone treatment, which, yes, I've figured out now that that was a big catalyst. And then a hysterectomy was another one, but not pregnancy. And I've got four children. And, yeah, same with you, Tiana. Yeah. Yeah, so I must admit that um, when I had my twins, I did not notice uh, specific lipoedema uh, progression at that time. It was more so, I mean, um, after I got um, a virus, and I've spoken about this on earlier episodes, I got a virus and that led to hyperthyroidism, like a short-term hyperthyroidism after the virus. And that is when I established progression. But during my pregnancy and after pregnancy, not so much. So there's definitely hope for the ladies, especially the younger ladies who have been diagnosed earlier, that they, if they still want to start a family, it's not a one size fits all. You don't always progress. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, okay, Jen, how do you manage your lipedema? So look, I'm definitely not your model lipedema patient. Um, so as I said, I've got two very young kids. Um, I'm kind of just surviving parenthood at this point. So to be honest, my lipedema management is very limited at the moment. Um, so prior to kind of having my children, I used to use a pneumatic compression pump every night. I'd do that for 60 minutes uh, or anywhere between 60 and 90 minutes a night. Uh, I use my vibration platform under my desk while I work. So throughout the day, I'll intermittently do 10 minutes of vibration for my feet. Um, I don't wear compression. It's not something that is part of my kind of regular wardrobe. Um, I wear it when I feel that I need it. So if I feel like I have swelling on a particular day or I know, you know, obviously when I'm flying, absolutely, I'll always wear compression. But yeah, it's not something that, for me, I have introduced into my lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Compression's a tricky one. I'm not very good at compression. <laughs> so yeah. Tia yeah look, Tiana's it, the it, queen. <laughs> it's not for I think the thing is, and and you touched on it before, that this condition can be so unique. And so particularly when you are diagnosed, there's there's a huge list of conservative management strategies that you can implement in your life to manage your lipedema. But I think it's impossible to do them all without basically quitting your job and just dedicating your time to those conservative measures 24 seven. And so you just have to pick and choose what works for you and where you think you get the biggest, you know, relief or results. Yeah. And what you can be consistent with, like the thing that you can do every day is the thing you should do every day. And yeah, trying to throw everything at it, um, yeah, you're not going to get anywhere. I think it would be such a relief for our listeners to hear you say that, Jen, that that there is so many conservative management uh, strategies out there and we just don't have to subscribe to them all. Um, so I certainly find that very freeing to hear from someone like you who is 
front and center in the lipedema community. Yeah, I'm certainly not your uh, your star patient, I suppose, in that regard. But um, but yeah, you have to find what works for you and and eating. You know, even when you talk about the nutritional side of things, keto works for some; it doesn't work for others. Um, and so I think yeah, it's it's important to remember that it's a largely unique condition. Although we all have the same diagnosis, the way in which we manage it isn't necessarily going to be the same person to person. I'd, um, I noted that you said when you were around 30, you started Googling for uh, your uh, lipedema, but did you get formally diagnosed, Jen? Yeah, so I, um, so as I said, Dr. Googling around 30, I managed to link in with a local um, manual lymphatic drainage therapist here in Sydney. Obviously, she was unable to provide me a formal diagnosis, but said, yeah, I think you're on the right path. Like, yes, I think you have this, but I'm not allowed to diagnose you. Um, and so it probably wasn't for a couple of years. It was at the point where I um, was considering starting a family. And so I had a consultation with, um, with a surgeon here in Sydney and said to him, what do you reckon? Should I be having liposuction before kids or after kids? Because it's a huge amount of money to invest. And, you know, if I'm going to have progression with pregnancy, should I be spending that money beforehand? And um, his opinion was, is that if I want a family and if I want it in the next few years, don't hesitate to have the family. The worst that happens is you do get some progression and maybe it results in an additional surgery being required. Um, but, you know, don't hold off on having a family because you're fearful that, that your life edema could progress further. I love that advice because we're so hard on ourselves, aren't we? And, uh, you know, for, for a lot of us women, when we get to, you know, coming onto our 30s, the idea of having a family seems um, like turns into a passion, I suppose, um, if it wasn't already. And having that fear in the back of your head that this uh, progressive disease may in fact get worse by something that you desperately want is really difficult to process. So it's nice that you got that advice to just do it and then deal with whatever happens later. Because as you said, it doesn't always result in progression. Yeah, that's exactly right. It doesn't always result in, in progression. And, you know, like I said, in my case, it hasn't. Excellent. I have just one more question for you uh, for your conservative management. You mentioned that you use your vibration platform uh, while you're working. Are you? Do you work from home usually? Yeah. So I'm very lucky that I work from home. My um my you know my work work my paid work actually shut our office at the beginning of COVID. Um. So yeah, I work from home. The same surgeon that I did consult with at the time. Um. His one of his pieces of advice was use your vibration platform throughout the day. And at the time, this was obviously before COVID happened and before working from home was the, um, was the normal. And I remember laughing, being like, how am I meant to have a vibration platform in the office? Um, I did consider it. And I remember talking to my boss at the time about it, being like, could I do this? Like, how would I make it work? And um yeah, at the time, we probably deemed that it was a workplace hazard and maybe not quite so ideal. But um, yeah, for those that work from home, I do highly recommend it. I was just imagining myself uh, with my big, heavy vibration platform up on the 14th floor of a government building and then <laughs> with everybody on an open plan floor listening to the horrendous noise of it. And I thought, mm, that's not... That's not something I'll be able to do. But when I work from home, I think it's a really good, a really good tip. Not to mention the <laughs> jiggling way as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Every time you talk, um, so your voice box starts to vibrate as well. It's quite funny. Um, That's right. Anyway, I digress. Thank you. Um, <laughs> now, I wanted to ask you about, um, tell us about Lipedema Australia and give us an insight into your role as the chair. Yeah, so Lipedema Australia is the peak body for lipedema in Australia. 
Um, we are predominantly the those that have lipedema. We do have one person on our board that doesn't, who is a physiotherapist. Um, so we are a volunteer patient-led board. Um, we are all females. I think right now, from memory, I really hope I get this right, there are 11 of us um, that are involved in the board and we are a wor working board as well. So we don't have any employees. So, you know, we set the strategy, but then we actually have to execute the work as well because we don't have any employees. Um, so I became chair at the beginning of this year, which is unusual timing when you're about to have a baby, but, um, you know, the stars aligned, the position became available and I thought I would put my hand up um, to give it a crack. So I, um, you know, I have an amazing group of passionate women that spend their time trying to better the lives of those with lipedema and you know, I've been really impressed. We've had um, a, a new bunch of board members come on recently and they're so enthusiastic and just the amount of work that we've done over awareness month and we've recently released a, a GP checklist that you can take to your GP to discuss your symptoms, which I think has been really well received is just phenomenal. Um, and the other thing as well, which I'm really proud of that we've just done is we've um, created a briefing pack for members of parliament so that we can try and get those conversations happening in that political space. That is just so amazing how far you've come just um, in this uh, Lipedema Awareness Month of June this year alone, let alone all of the work that you've done in previous years. Congratulations for being the chair at such a crazy time in your personal life as well. <laughs> Um, with the two yeah. young children, that is no small feat, I must say. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it does require, um, it certainly requires my husband's patience as I ditch him Monday, Tuesday and Thursday nights for meetings with the, um, with the toddler and the baby, but uh, we, we are surviving. And I see that you're an organisation extraordinaire with a love of spreadsheets. So that's also very handy when you're trying to execute a whole bunch of strategic goals in an organisation <laughs> such as Lipedema Australia. That's right. That's right. Um, how, what's the best way for the community to connect with Lipedema Australia? Yeah, so this is, a, this is a good time to mention it, actually. So we're actually in the process of um, getting regular newsletters sent out. So I would suggest at this point, actually, one of the best ways to get in contact with us is to sign up for our newsletter. At the moment, we are hoping to get them out kind of once a month-ish. You know, that might be a little bit longer. It might be a bit shorter. But uh, we're hoping to maintain that regular communication. But one of the things as well that we're also trying to capture at the same time, once you sign up for the newsletter, you're then prompted to provide your postcode. And part of the reason for that is that we're working on a bit of activity, which we're not quite ready to announce yet, but we're hoping to be able to utilise those postcodes to actually help women to speak to their members of parliament and really kind of target certain areas at a time. So that's one of the things that I would recommend everyone does is to hop on our website, sign up to the newsletter and then provide a postcode. Um, and then I suppose the other ways which uh, I think most people would already be aware of is we've got our private Facebook support group, which is Lapidema Australia. Um, our public page also titled Life Edema Australia, so it can get a bit confusing as to which one you're in. Um, and then we've got Instagram as well, which we use just as regularly. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to mention the, um, the petition that uh, Lipedema Australia established back in 2019 for the Medicare number for Lipedema. And um, it's been going since its inception back in uh, 2019, and it's up to 21,744 signatures, which is an amazing effort. Um, and I've heard some uh, whisperings, and I don't know how accurate this is, that there is actually a Medicare number um, for uh, lipedema there, but it's not activated. Do you have any insight into what's happening at the moment? 
I haven't heard about um, there being a number that's there but not active. So I'm not sure if there's any truth to it. If there is, we obviously haven't been informed around it. Um, so at the moment, we are in the process of getting together information for the Medicare application. I think, you know, as soon as you're diagnosed with lipoedema, you clearly understand there's a huge amount of costs that are involved just in conservative management, let alone if you then consider surgery further from there. Um, and so naturally you do get frustrated that it's not covered by Medicare and it's hard to not feel annoyed. But I think one of the things that would be really helpful for everyone to be aware of is actually it's not kind of just a two page application. The amount of um, research that we need to provide for this for the Medicare application is huge. Um, and at this point, we don't believe that all the research is there to back up the application itself. Um, and so it's unfortunately not going to be a quick win as such. Um, there are plenty of organisations. I know that to get the lymphedema codes, they actually had to apply multiple times as well. So even once we do a first round application, we may not be successful and may have to try again after that. That is so important for our listeners to hear just um, how much work is going into advocating for us um, as a community and how much paperwork that you have to go through to actually change these policies um, within the system. So on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for your efforts. I do hope we see some sort of solution in the future, but um, I can imagine that it's no easy feat. Yeah, oh, 100%. Like, that's the ultimate goal, right? Like, I came into the chair role and that's what I want to achieve. I would love to see that Medicare does, uh, you know, I, I suppose Australia now has lipoedema in its ICD code. So it does recognise that lipoedema exists, but from a Medicare perspective, there's obviously just not that coverage. So that would be the, the best outcome from my perspective is having that um, coverage. I think one thing to keep in mind just on the Medicare piece while we're talking about it is that it's not going to necessarily solve all of our issues. And so what I mean by that is our treatments, our conservative treatments are not all going to become free. And if you consider the surgical route, it's probably still going to need to be conducted in a private hospital. So whilst you might get a bit more back from Medicare than what some individuals do get now, the, the actual amount of savings is hard to say what that actually might equate to. That's really important information. Thank you, Jen. Um, before Shelley wraps us up with our favourite last question, I just wanted to know from you, Jen, what is your... Um, what does the rest of your management look like in terms of lipoedema? Are, are you just going to stick with conservative management? Are you looking for surgery? What's your plan? So at the moment, I'm just doing conservative management. Um, I am not sure if I'm done with kids yet. And so I'm kind of going to wait a few years to figure that out. If we have another one, then obviously I wouldn't consider surgery for a while. I think... Um, I was chatting to someone earlier today and I think from my perspective, I would love to get on top of it before perimenopause if I can. Um, but at the same time, I'm also conscious that surgery isn't always the best thing for people. I'm conscious that my lipoedema might not progress with perimenopause either. Given that it didn't progress with pregnancy, maybe it might not. Maybe I don't need surgery. So I think it's something that I will consider at some point, but it's not something that's on the cards for me anytime soon. Awesome. Awesome. Over to you, Shell. Okay, this is my favourite last question. Oh, I did have it there and now I've just <laughs> jumped out. Oh, Jen, I'm so sorry. I jumped off of your... Um... Okay. Okay. <laughs> If you could go back and give your younger self a pep talk, what would you tell her? Um, I think, look, I think it's not your fault is one of the things that I'd cover off. But I think one of the things that I'd really try and instill in my younger self is actually that there isn't a certain way that you have to look. 
I think within society, there's this expectation that you're thin and have no cellulite and look hot all the time. And that's just not the reality of life. You know, we have ups and downs in life. And so I think trying to convince myself that actually I don't need to look a certain way and that who I am outside of how I look is what matters. Yeah, that's massive, isn't it? It's these expectations that we try and live up to. And then it's like we lose our true selves with that. And yeah, yeah, that's a great one. That's awesome. Well, that is the end of our questioning for I you, think, Jen. Oh, Tiana has something. I think this has been such one of the most insightful episodes that we've had to date, Jen. I would love to get you and um, any of the Lipedema Australia um, members on at any time. Please get in touch with us. We really appreciate you coming on and, um, and letting the community know exactly what, efforts you guys are going to for us um, and we so appreciate it thank you very much for having me it was um it was great this is now my second life at Emma podcast I've recorded in the last few months so I think that's also really exciting right it's exciting that these things are happening more and more often and you know the words getting out there I think the awareness is getting out there and um We've, we announced during June Awareness Month that we're going to be holding a webinar for GPs, for GP education. And, you know, I just, I think that everything's got a bit of momentum at the moment and it's a, it's an exciting time. Yeah, collectively Truly. we're making some noise. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jen. We'll let you get back to your family now. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. You have a great evening. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> yes, sounds good. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Lipedema podcast. Lipedema and its symptoms vary from individual to individual. The opinions and advice voiced on this podcast are of a personal nature and used for educational purposes. Please take away from this podcast what resonates with you and please see your GP or preferred specialist for diagnosis and healthcare. We are Shelley and Tiana from the Lipedema podcast. Until our next episode, bye for now.